Hello, everyone. I'm Allison, and welcome to my weekly Meltdown's coverage of the Real World New York Homecoming episodes one through four. Uh, as always, with me, Tyler Lyons, and Matt is in the is hyped up on Mountain Dew, just warning everybody. <laughs> and Sam Higdon, a junior in high school, I love it. We're gonna corrupt the hell. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's a, an interesting show. Um, I just, I just want to start out by saying we're going to cover some very sensitive things, and um, I just want to go out and say um, I'm still learning how to understand and speak correctly, mm -hmm. and if I say anything that is not right or correct or there's a different way or a better way a more sensitive way please say something in the chat i'm you know i'm i'm deep in the south i'm a little ignorant to some things but i try my hardest and uh i just want to say um so forgive me please correct me i love constructive Criticism. Well, I, I also want to say, like, same goes for me as well. Yeah. I hope that that goes without saying. Um, but of course, like, if I say any, anything that's like, uh, probably shouldn't say that, please let me know. I will absolutely apologize and correct myself. Yeah. Um, but that's the uh, that's the whole the whole thing for this, this, especially this season of the real world is like uh, encouraging these conversations that yes. people would never have otherwise. Right. Right. And Matt already wants to cancel me. <laughs> it's the Mountain Dew talking. Listen, I've said from day one, the real world is what started the whole thing for me. The summer of 92, I was 15 years old and it was the show that really introduced me you know, to reality television. And yeah. I was introduced to people that I've never met or been around in my life. Uh, you know, just being a 15 year old kid in high of, of sophomore in high school, I didn't know anybody like this. Um, mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, I went to a predominantly white high school, so I didn't see a lot of people of color. Um, mm -hmm. There weren't that many. So, and everybody was very, as they say, basic. So you, you had the popular cheerleaders and you had me, the nerd, and, you know, it was just very different. So to see these people, all different kinds of people from walks of life really opened my eyes and brought attention to things to me I never would have seen without reality television, without the real world season one, New York. If you, if you hear scratching, uh, that's my dog. I'm currently uh, watching her. Usually Tim is watching her for me when I'm doing these shows, but he's not here this weekend. Uh, so yeah. if, you, if you hear her, uh, just ignore her. Stop Guys, it. we're in for a treat. Sora might take a dump in the background. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've already pre-warned Allison for that. Um, but Allison, so like going back to like, when did the season air? 1992? It was in 1992. It was the uh -huh. summer of 92. Um, back then, MTV played predominantly um, music videos. Yeah. And um, they had the spring break special every year. And that was a big deal. Like, you, that was like a whole week of you know, all these, you know, musicians hosting parties and all this stuff. And, you know, when I got home from school, I watched uh, Total Request Live before it was Carson Daly show. I think it was called something else. I can't remember. But something that a lot of people don't know they, with the history of the real world, people were, were so in a, they were kind of obsessed with all of these people in the background and everything that was going on with MTV Spring Break, it kind of gave the producers the idea of what if we took seven of these random people and put them in a, a living quarters just to see what would happen and and thus and i think they considered it world. like because reality tv wasn't even a genre at this point you know like they, they kind yeah. of considered it more like documentary style is was their goal yeah whenever you 
there was a like a documentary about two women and uh, Grey Gardens. I think uh, they actually I, HBO made a movie about it. It had Jessica Lange in it and Drew Barrymore. And it was about two real life women that lived in a rundown house with cats. And I can't remember who they were. That was kind of something I had seen the the real documentary before they made it into a movie. And there were little things here and there. I saw Truth or Dare in 1991. That was the closest thing to reality with Madonna. You can only imagine. I was introduced to some things I didn't really understand. Um, but OK, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. Oh, Matt, I got it. I, I, I'm, okay. I'm keeping up with the I'm chat. I'm, I'm just okay. trying to go back a little bit. Um, Totally. Yeah. But it's important. You know, it's yeah. important. Like before we go into homecoming, it's important to set the precedent in terms of like what this meant for like the reality TV we even right. know today. You know, this was the blueprint for all of that stuff. You wouldn't have the challenge. You wouldn't have Survivor. any of these shows. I mean, I really feel like this show is the blueprint. And they and I, and I told y'all last week if you haven't yet on e andy cohen history of reality television the first episode is about the real the original real world go watch it because they talk about um they had no idea what they were going into a lot of these people already lived in new york you know, you, you had the implants from, you know, like Ju Julie from Alabama. I related, I'll be honest with you, I related a lot to Julie because I was 15. And oddly enough, I related to Heather's attitude. I've always kind of felt like I, I can was see a that mixture <laughs> of Heather and Julie. Like I felt like that was me when they would get together. I'd be like, I love it. It's just, you know, and they spoke a lot of truths. They had disagreements, some real heated disagreements, and they came to resolutions unlike now on these reality shows, like the real world 33 or the challenge 89, mm -hmm. you know, it's get drunk and throw glasses at each other and there's no resolution. Everybody's just acting ridiculous so back then they you know they had a resolution even in mm -hmm. season two they did the same thing yeah. um in season three which season i was three, actually going to ask you like who who you kind of identified with at the time uh so julie is the sorry as far as i can go in that's um but um so julie is is your answer to that would you say like that's still true now 30 years later um, I think 30 years later, um, I kind of feel like I relate to Julie still and Heather and I actually, I kind of have with the new episodes, uh, Eric, um, I have really found like a, what do they call it? A, uh, like a kindred spirit type kindred, of thing, kindred spirit, a soul animal, whatever you call it. Yeah in Eric because he hit rock bottom. He lost everything and he mm. reinvented himself and make, you know, and just the, his words of wisdom, just, I so believe. And I, so I get it. And I hate that right now that he's in quarantine and he, he can't be there because I'm, I'm living for this Heather and Eric reunion. Um, yeah. <laughs> some people have evolved in in 30 years uh julie definitely man the things that she does uh, i'm not shocked you know she was just great mm -hmm. uh eric has evolved look what kevin has done um andre's hair has changed um, you know, Heather is Heather B. You know, Heather, she's got a podcast. She's out there. She's doing it. She's got a food show. She's, you know, making things happen. Um, Norman, unfortunately, his life kind of unraveled with the stock crash and fall of 2008 and COVID. He kind of lost everything and has had to rebuild his life through his art and everything. And he's got a great support system with his old friends from the real world and his family. Yeah. Um, 
That but that's what I love. Yeah. Like, so uh, what's so me watching this? Like, yeah. full disclosure, I have never seen the original first season of the Real okay. World, and I and I certainly want to go back uh, and revisit that once like right. this is all done. But I kind of want to watch this in its own like capsule of something. Um, and it's just amazing to me, Allison, how like even thirty years later, like these people are like just as complex, like can carry a conversation, and like you know, like uh, I think Eric is a really good example. You know, he uh, on paper he's just like a model, right? Just like yeah. a hot guy who is in like really great shape, um, but he just has this like whole like spiritual side to him, which is really beautiful and really deep, and uh, just his story of like you know, uh, climbing up that mountain and like having this like self-discovery and uh, overcoming like addiction and stuff like that. Um, it's, very, very cool. It's funny to me because back then after he did the real world, he hosted the grind for three years. And mm. that was like a dance thing. Show. He had workout videos. Like he was really the person that. Like the face of the real the world. After the real world. Okay. And Something, a side note, some people don't know, Julie and Heather got an apartment together mm. after the first season ended and lived together for, I, I want to say almost a year. Julie wanted wow. to stay. So, and she lived with Heather and really wow. wanted to still experience the city life. And, you know, the, the sad thing to me is there's, there were heated discussions between Kevin and Becky yeah, and there which was, has been like the focus of like the, the first focus. like three episodes. And then there was the heated argument between Julie and Kevin. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to walk you through my 15 year old mind versus my 44 year old mind. OK, yeah. at this time and I'm speaking truthfully and honestly, I mean, no disrespect to anyone of color at all. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make that very clear. I had never seen a black male like Kevin. Very, I mean, very educated and smart and a writer. And I was intrigued because I had never been around it. OK, mm -hmm. and to see him really, ha you know, it just it amazed me. I was just fascinated. At with such him. a young age. Too. He was 26 at the time. And when he and Julie got into their argument, mm -hmm. I back, back then, then, not back now, then, right? Yeah. Back in 92, you know, she was like, you're racist against white people and you you make it a color thing. My 15 year old mind, only knowing where I had been and what I had seen, agreed with Julie. Mm -hmm. Flash forward 29, 30 years later, I completely see where Kevin was coming from. Yeah. And it makes me feel like I felt guilty for a long time. But then again, I thought I think I shouldn't feel guilty because I was a child, just as Julie was a child. And I didn't really understand what he was saying, but growing up and opening my mind to other people and experiences, I really, really get it. And then you go back to, you go to the Becky and Kevin fight a few weeks later, dude, it was the same thing 30 years. It's a later. lot of the same discussions that us right. Americans are having now at we're, like the front still, of politics. Right. We're still having it now. And when I say it really hasn't changed, Kevin was really heated and would, you know, get real, you know, he was real frustrated with Becky because she wouldn't listen. Yeah. And um, he ended up calling her racist and all this stuff. And it wasn't really backing it up in the way that he is now. So right. he has evolved as well. Becky, unfortunately, I do not think understands. But yeah. let's get to the cast. I can see you've got it popped up. If you want to go ahead and bring them up, we uh, can go. Well, I, I, I think we should like keep talking about uh, okay. this topic first before, because I want to add in like some of, of my perspective yeah. uh, as well. So, um, you know, of course, like me seeing like, so basically what happened was production showed on like a TV, like flashback to like, 
uh, uh, Kevin fighting with Julie, Kevin fighting yeah. with Becky uh, mm -hmm. about these race issues and stuff like that. And Becky started arguing with Kevin about like, listen, I'm not a racist. And, and she said like, I, I'm not gonna be a part of this like narrative that you wanna push on me. Uh, right. I, uh, I have taken like an African dance class, which was just very, uh, um, you know, not, not, not the best thing to say, <laughs> right? Listen, and then she's got to throw in the, I lost my color when I was taking the African dance class. Right. But that's Listen. the problem is like so many white people, they don't understand like how problematic yes. things like I don't see color or I have black friends, so I can't be racist. Like things like that. It's And it's when you say things like that, okay, fine. You have a lot of friends that uh, are people of color and you aren't like that, but you don't understand the struggle that black people, people of color have been through. Yeah. So to say, I'm not racist. I played basketball all like Eric did back in the early episodes. I played basketball and I was doing all this stuff. So I have a lot of black friends. So I don't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. You, it is, that is like, inadvertently a racist thing to say yeah. without malicious intent behind it. And I'm sorry, I'm a white woman and I'm speaking about this and I, I don't want to offend anyone. I just kind of feel like I'm speaking my truth, you know, Absolutely. and I have learned so much. There are things that I've said that I didn't realize were racist mm -hmm. and it took someone to open my eyes to that yeah you know totally. I was like, i've always liked black people my best friend in kindergarten was a little black girl well congratulations elson good for you you know i mean just things like that it's it's not sensitive it's insensitive it's and, not and, but like the difference between becky and somebody like you or julie's background is mm -hmm. all these years later like you guys have listened to what people like Kevin have had to say about this issue. Um, and you've grown from it and learned from it. Like I, I, and I really see kind of like a fork in growth uh, between mm -hmm. uh, Becky and Julie, the two like white women in the house and how like oh. one has just kind of like hardened in her own opinions and like where Julie has like really listened and uh, grown. So she actually shared a story about how, um, so she lives like, I think she said like 10 minutes from Selma or something like that. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. and she was watching on the news, like the, the big march uh, that happened a few years ago there. And she like looked at the TV, like her and her kids were watching it on the news. And she's like, this is so stupid. Like, why are we watching this on TV instead of going down there? So she took her kids down there and her kids said, mom, I, I feel like very scared right now. And, and, and Julie asked why, why do you feel scared? And she said, because I like, there's not a lot of white people here. I am in the minority. And Julie said, you know, that is how people of color feel every single day of their lives. How uh, do you think it was for those people back then? Yeah, totally. Um, and having just things just thrown at them. Like, teaching moment yeah. for her kids, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and, and that like stuff like that is like how you <laughs> attempt to break the cycle. Uh, whereas like Becky is like, you know, she, uh, from my understanding, she like really mooches off of her parents' wealth and lifestyle mm -hmm. and therefore like has the privilege to just kind of like shelter herself away from dealing with these issues um, that, she, that don't relate to her somehow. You she, know? she catches me as the kind of person who has friends that she surrounds herself with that are probably from all walks of life. Yeah. And just enable this. Yeah. and think it's fascinating and never call her on her shit. Mm -hmm. And let me be frank, just because someone calls you on your shit, that doesn't mean they don't care. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it, it, it's not that way. We're yeah. kind of living in a world now where it's cancel culture or everybody's offended. These are things that have been going on for years that need to be addressed. And now we have the voices and the platforms and the media for people to stand up. Nathan Beckman Ford mm -hmm. in Memphis, Tennessee, 
statue was taken down, I think in 2014 or 15. And um, it was like such a momentous occasion. It was pouring down rain and they had this crane pulling the statue of him on a horse off with lights around it. And everybody was just like, this symbol is now gone. Yeah. And, you know, and of course he and his wife were buried under that and they had to be exhumed and moved. And that angered a lot of people. But it, I, I agree we need our history. We mm -hmm. need to know where we came from. But when it is something like that, when it was put up in a time, it where just it was needs, like to be praised it, instead be of praised. like to be remembered. You know what it I mean? Um, I actually had that discussion with my my grandparents who, you know, they're they're pretty conservative. Um, like my whole family is pretty conservative. And they said like, you know, can you, believe, can you believe they're like taking down the statues? And I'm like, well, why are they like in a public park when like all of these people that have been oppressed by this person uh, have to walk by that and see that every day uh, where like instead, like it, I feel like if you just put it in like a museum or something like that, it's certainly not going to be forgotten anytime soon, but there is a proper place to like learn about the history of that and what we as a society have have grown from. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's uh, so and as soon as I said that, you know, they asked they actually listened to me like pretty well. They were like, wow, that's that's a really good point. And I haven't I, and I hadn't thought about it like that. And that's what I love to see is like bridging those gaps and like listening to one another rather than like Becky just frankly had enough and just like shut down. Well, it and the constant interrupting. Yeah. Like you're never going to learn anything if you don't listen. And Kevin handled it completely different mm -hmm. than he did 30 years ago. And even uh, Eric and Kevin got into an argument uh, back in the old episodes and Kevin wrote Eric a letter and said, um, you know, you will never understand what it's like to be me. Your totally. life is valued a lot more than mine. And he, that's when he was like, well, I have, I have black friends. I don't understand. He's talking about that. <laughs> You're completely missing the point. Listen to this. Okay. So I'm watching the Falcon and Winter Soldier. I'm going to, I have uh, Sora just went potty. So I'm going to go. <laughs> okay. Well, that. I'll tell my, my story. I'll, I'll tell back. my story. I got two stories I can tell y'all. I was watching the winter, uh, this the the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, some big comic book movie nerd geek, whatever. I don't care. And in the second episode, Sam and Bucky are having a disagreement in the street, and a cop car shows up, and they immediately start hassling Sam because he's black. And they were asking Bucky, "What's wrong? Is he bothering?" And he was like, "No." He's not bothering me. We're just having a conversation. And it's just showing that it's just something that is, it's just, ha it's everywhere. Like he was even in this, but uh, while he's gone, I have a side note, I have a funny story. So I work for my brother-in-law's gutter company. Okay. And I got a phone call today from this old man. And he sounded like he forgot to put his dentures in and was <laughs> drunker and cooter brown. Okay, Google Cooter Brown. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> and I couldn't understand him, and I was trying to get information from him. I'm not gonna say what he said his first name was, but it sounded like he said his last name was Fart. And so, of course, my 13 year old brain starts <laughs> going places. And I said, Okay, sir, can you spell that? You know, uh, and he was, cause he had said F H A R T <laughs> and I was like, okay, that is F H A. Okay. And, and I was like, well, okay. I, you know, how do you pronounce that? And then he got angry and he hung up on me mm -hmm. and I tried to call him back to apologize because I don't know if your last name is fart or fart or fart or is the F silent when does that ever happen in front of heart? I don't know, but okay, that's Allison's story while Tyler cleans up poop. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. I'm back, I'm back. Um, <laughs> that's so, a commercial break. 
Um, of course, like once we saw Becky, like ultimately yeah. make the decision to, to quit, um, I, there were a few things that I like had written down to talk about. Yes. So the first is, so like Becky and Julie have like a side conversation, like in like the bedroom and Julie's like the cameraman, like comes into the bedroom. Right. And Julie's I, like, you got to cut it out. out. Like seriously. Yeah. And I just feel like, uh, I feel like the production team has so much respect for these seven people, like in any other season of the real world or any reality show, if, if they get told me, like, get the camera out of my face, like we're not recording this. Do you know what they would say back to them? Uh, you signed your life away. We're going to film whatever we want. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, That's how it is on the challenge and the real world and every, I mean, the, the big brother. Yeah. And all of that. That's how yeah. it is now. Yeah. Um, and I also enjoyed how, um, yeah, I, I think Becky was the one that pointed out. She's like, "Wow, like some of these uh, camera crew are women," uh, and they were like, "You know, back when we filmed like 30 years ago, it was all white men." And and I love how the camera person said to to Becky back. She was like, uh, "Yeah, like even the the director is female now." Uh, hey, and yeah. I yeah. I just love that like little celebration of of women and like uh, kind of like breaking that fourth wall between cameraman and. Uh, this is true, but also Becky reached through the fourth wall mm -hmm. and dated one of the producers of the original season of the oh, world really? and he mm -hmm. lost his job <laughs> over that. And in the finale, the, the finale episode of the real world, they stormed the production room mm -hmm. and it was really cool because the production was in the apartment with them in a, ah. in a separate room. And it was so funny. It was that so is cool. cool. Huh. And uh, anyway, I hope I didn't, um, uh, <laughs> We're bringing anything for anybody no, no, no. Um, but um, you know, I I think so. When Becky decided to quit, right? I, I think that that she really framed it as like I I was unhappy with like production springing this on me, and like yeah. I think that she thinks that like MTV is trying to like force like this narrative to happen by like showing that conversation and like you know they they really like kind of forced that conversation to happen on air yeah um which you know that's eh, it, it is what it is but like it, it was a really good callback right to uh, what they were talking about 30 years ago and, and i feel like it did create good moments but she was just really fed up that i feel like production put her in that situation to begin yeah. with but at the same time, to me, Tyler, I kind of see it a little different. Mm -hmm. I see it as production showed that clip because they wanted to see how far everyone had evolved. Yeah. And Becky is too busy talking about the chateau in France that she lives in and her little dances that she does and all of this stuff. And it's just like even Kevin's like, I'm so tired of hearing about it. I don't even know what to tell you. Yeah. And they, this argument to me was worse than the one 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't get a word if, to me. So who was it in the chat? I think um, Matt Henning said, Becky seemed most offended that Norman didn't side with her and told her to shut up. I wonder if that's the first time she considers a friend has Let me tell you something. He called her on her shit. Mm -hmm. And then when she leaves and says, this is all fake. And he's like, was well, our friendship fake? And she goes, well, it is now. I mean, yeah, that's, the that's pretty left, well. just the way. Bye. See yeah. ya. I'm out of here. It's, you, I don't believe they were using her. In I that don't way. either. Like, I, I'm just trying to, uh, to, to, explain like what she was thinking in that moment in terms mm -hmm. of like shutting down um and it's a shame because like i feel like the the other six understand like just how incredible of an opportunity this is to have all seven of them together to to come back like this uh, like this cannot be understated like this is a once in a lifetime thing that we are watching here uh and it, it's such a special experience it is it's rare it probably will be close to impossible to happen again. If you look at future seasons, people have yeah. died. Yeah. We will never have season three all together because, you know, Pedro Pedro, Zamora yeah. passed away and, yeah. who, you know, Puck ain't going to do it. And yeah. uh, I, I, whatever. But and and season two, that was just. I don't know if anybody's going to come back from that one, but I mean, I just. Would. 
feel like this was really the platform. Yeah, totally. But like, uh, and I think it works so well with like this first uh, season. And this is kind of where we can like go into like each of the cast members. But yeah. um, what I'm really finding, Allison, is like no matter the topic, I feel like the conversation bounces to like each person having like their story and their input uh, so so like fluidly, so effortlessly, uh, and so like complex, you know, uh, and, and that's like that's what I feel like is the magic here is like how complex these casting choices are, like how, how great storytellers these are, how amazing these people are at talking and sharing their stories uh, and, and finding ways to connect to one another. Right. Like Eric and uh, Heather B was like a, a really good example of that. Yeah. Oh um, God. They, they tripped me out. And yeah. you've got to think about it at the same time, the LA riots happened while this mm -hmm. was filming. Uh, the cops that beat Rodney King got off yeah. while this was filming. There were a lot of historical things that happened while this was filming. Yeah. Filming. Uh, Matt says, there was no one person telling all the story. It was a very shared narrative. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's what I, I feel like reality TV casting nowadays is very like, let's find somebody to, to fill this stereotype, this role, right? Mm -hmm. um, where like... I feel like each each of these people have like such a, a layer to them now, mm -hmm. um, but uh, okay. So let's go ahead and start. Because uh... they were casting back then, honestly. Not right. it's like I said in my Twitter and Facebook posts. Right. These aren't influencers from Instagram. Right. Exactly. Or Twitter. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so, I, so uh, wait, actually, uh, it's funny that you say that because I looked them up on social media. Yeah. They, they each only have like three or four thousand, five thousand followers. Uh, and I, and I love that. <laughs> That's about sorry. to change. That is really about to change. I love it. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. No. So Andre, um, the singer, guitarist, performed in many bands after the show and has since gone solo. He released Wrong Within, his first EP in March 2020. To me, I, I like Andre. At first, it, it, to me, he came off as someone who was hard to read. Yeah. Um, but as you get to know him and as the season went on and as this season is progressing, you're really seeing him. To me, he seems like the calm center. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, I, I agree. I actually have in my notes, like Andre is really good at, at peacemaking one-on-one. -on -one. So like yeah. after like all of the shit went down, uh, he took, um, what's his name? Uh, um, Kevin, Kevin yeah, he took Kevin out uh, and was like, you know, I just want to check in with you. How are you feeling? Uh, yeah. He did the same thing with Julie uh, in this last episode. And uh, I feel like Andre is just somebody that comes off very like warm and inviting for people to open up to um, and empathize yeah. with. I feel like he's like a huge empath. Um, and he's a musician as well. So I feel like that kind of goes hand in hand a lot. And I remember seeing him for the first time. I just all the MTV videos like Soundgarden and Metallica and that Eddie Vedder, early nineties, you know, the hair, it was very, he was very repre representative of that kind yeah. of era at the time. But um, I feel I like he's the one that we've seen the least of so far. So I, I, I'm sure that there's going to be an episode mm -hmm. or two coming up that kind of feature him more heavily. Yeah. Oh, Becky Blass Band continued her singing career after the show, signing a recording contract and financing an album called the Rebecca Blass Band. <laughs> she lives in New Mexico and released her latest album here in 2017. Now, listen, I don't know Becky Blass Band. I don't know her personally. I don't want to attack someone when they are truly ignorant and they really don't understand. But I feel like her ignorance and inability to understand is due to her inability to shut her mouth and listen. And listen. That yeah. is the most important thing. I hear you, 
but am I listening to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, well, I hear what you're saying. No, but you're not listening. You're not like me. taking it in and like yeah. trying to put, put yourself in his shoes and, and understand. Right. right. Um, so, yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. Like they show in the preview that like Julie and, and Becky have a conversation. Um, and I'm, not, I'm actually really surprised that Becky allowed that conversation to be on camera. Um, so we'll oh, see what well, happens. She wants to be back on camera. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> it's happening. She's I hope so. I hope she comes back and I hope there's a resolution because this is just like way too special of a thing for um They called her the Karen of the house. Yeah. I mean, she's acting like the Karen, Janet, and Linda mm -hmm. of the house. No offense if that's your name and you're cool, but you know, she ain't helping you out. Okay. Eric. Eric was so cute. Oh my goodness. Let's see. Eric Nice competed on three seasons of The Challenge following his time on The Real World and stayed in the entertainment world for 20 years, hosting various specials on MTV. The New Jersey native is married with one child. Hmm. I wonder if he married Missy. Some <laughs> old school people get that reference. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, his evolution, I think to me, is the most amazing. I just love listening to him talk he actually spoke about i think in the most recent episode that his agent or someone took all his money he lost everything mm -hmm. and he said it turns out the worst thing in the world that happened to me turns out to be the best thing and this is something that i have a 24 year old son um you know and i'm about to be a grandmother and, you know, look, the kid's done some shit. Who wasn't doing dumb stuff in their 20s, okay? I, I wasn't. I was raising a baby. But anyway, it, you know, you kind of, I, did, I waited till I was in my 30s. <laughs> but, it, 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 it got, but I mean, like, you know, he, you know, gets rolled down on himself. And I'm like, Jacob, everything, or I'm sorry, Spider-Man, everything that you, you're going to learn from this and you're going to be better. And he's finally seeing that. And I think Eric is proof that he lost everything, but he gained himself in the process. Totally. He, he's a very spiritual person. Uh, yeah. Very. Um, and of course, like he, he did um, like everybody got tested before they, they came in oh. and he unfortunately did test positive for COVID. Um, and I was really worried that like, it was going to be awkward with him, like videoing yeah. in. Um, but I think it works pretty well, you know, like I, I feel like he's contributing pretty naturally to all the conversations. Um, and they certainly could have just been like, all right, well, you, you can't like, uh, be a part of the season and just yeah. like sent him home or whatever. So I'm glad that like, they're, they're still making him like an integral part went, of everything. And they went to his hotels, Matt pointed out, and that was like, oh my God, I'm going to cry. I know. But you know what's funny is, um. I don't think if it had been for COVID, we wouldn't have seen him. Yep. COVID has changed Zoom, whatever. It has really changed a lot of things. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. So next we have um, Heather. I don't know where B came from when I said Heather B. She's just but... Heather B. That's what she is. She's Heather B. Gardner competed on the uh, of a one season of the challenge. We got to find that. I don't remember that before fo focusing fully on her music career. She released two albums in 96 and 02. And she briefly hosted Sway in the morning. I remember that radio show and starred as herself in Death Wish in 2018. I love Heather. I can relate to Heather. Everything that comes out of her mouth. It's like, well, you can go ahead and leave the room. We're still going to keep talking about you. You know, mm -hmm. I get it. Like, I love it. She's so real and honest. And she's like, I'm not going after Becky. That's a grown ass woman. If she wants to leave, she can leave. And if she wants to come back, she can come back. She yeah. made her choice. She, it, people need to be accountable for the choices they make. Yeah. And it, she chose to leave. And the way she left, see ya, don't want to be here. It's fake. I just... That really bothered me, but I really, really just love her. Yeah, I, I was, um, I, I was really her. waiting. Sorry, um, I was really waiting for her to kind of like weigh in on the whole uh mm -hmm. Becky racism discussion thing, um, and she didn't 
speak like pretty much at all. Uh, she really just like let Becky uh, say her piece and and peace out. And and Heather said she was one of the only people not to reach out to her after she left. Uh, and I I feel like it's it's um very very big of Heather to just you know say yeah. like everybody is entitled to their opinion. Like it doesn't like change my view of things. Um, and cause I kind of expected, um, the, the two of, uh, her and, and Kevin to kind of like have this discussion together with Becky, but, um, they, uh, not to interrupt you, but listen, yeah. they're two very different people of color. Um, and they even discuss this. I can't remember if it was in this homecoming or the original, they came from two completely different backgrounds. He didn't, his father, Kevin's father disowned him at eight years old, mm. wanted nothing to do with him. He was raised by a single mother. They struggled to make ends meet. Heather had both of her parents. They were divorced, but they lived down the street from each other. So she had two active parents mm. in her life. She went to a private school. Like she had a very different okay. upbringing. So a lot of the things that Kevin experienced she didn't experience. Okay. That makes so sense. They, so her opinion is a little bit different. Yeah. And I think sitting back and seeing how Becky is acting, was acting. Why is he Heather being going to waste her time? Mm -hmm. Why yeah. people tell somebody stuff they go listen? Yeah. You know? And um, I, I really love her, like what I know slash what I learned uh, journal thing that she's doing each yeah. day. Um, I, I just feel like she understands like how special this experience is and, and, uh, the things that she can learn from it and stuff. Um, I, I definitely want to listen to her podcast. <laughs> I want like to just hang out a with wise her. Woman. I want to hang out with her on the couch under a blanket and just, <laughs> no, I mean, I just love it. I love it. Oh boy. Julie Gentry, the Alabama native is married to a Birmingham restaurant to Is that right? Restaurant, restaurant, rest, restaurateur. Um, Gentry and the and they have two children. And Ju I'm not surprised. Julie is just amazing. I think she helps underprivileged children with mm -hmm. the college process, mm -hmm. filling out the paperwork and getting the financial aid and all of that. And uh, she's just really, to me, to me. Andre and Julie are kind of the center. Like they are like the calm, like they yeah. are the two that you're going to go to. Yeah. Like if you really need to keep that. Yeah. To, to me, like, and, and they kind of like hinted at this by saying like, they think that Julie was like the first one cast for everybody. Uh, to me, it feels like Julie is like the heart of the real world of New York. Um, and so I watched like the, the first like 15 minutes of the first episode. Uh, and I feel like it was like all about Julie, like uh, leaving Alabama, like, and, and her dad was like, you, you're saying the word, but now uh, like, that's how like different of a world that Julie was in well, before she came to New York for the first time. Uh, she rode her first cab coming in uh, and they showed her like riding the an, another cab coming 30 years later. Um, it's just a very cool uh, she, juxtaposition. Her experience coming into the real world, you know, she flat out told Kevin, you know, my father doesn't like black people mm -hmm. and I'm very different from the people that I'm around. And when she said that when I was 15 years old, that struck a chord with me because I thought, you know, my dad isn't like, you know, wouldn't like that, but I just, I have family members and people around me who are like that. And I could feel being different. Like mm -hmm. I've always felt misplaced where I am because I have such different views. And the reason I do feel the way I do and see things the way I do is through reality television and TV shows. Mm -hmm. It has been a classroom for me. Yeah, it really has. And it was for Julie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Julie's uh, opinions like really resonated with a lot of people who are watching this for the first time. And, and it's cool to see like, that I don't know, Julie just seems like such a spectacular person now in 2021 that like it's cool to see that like um 
with like education and with listening, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all of that can, can be unlearned and you can grow as a person. Um, it, I don't know. Julie is just so like captivating to me. She's so like, uh, warm and inviting for people. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think like out of everybody, I think Julie is my favorite. Yep. Like I said, I've always felt like a Julie and Heather. Yeah. If they had yeah, a baby, a lot of sense. if they had a baby, it'd yeah. be me. Yeah. Uh, this is exactly what I mean, Matt. Becky yeah. hears Julie listens. Uh huh. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I love Kevin. I'll be honest with you. Back in the day, I didn't really like Kevin because I didn't understand him. And now that I'm older and I do understand, I adore this man. Yeah, I really do. And when he was having his convert, trying to have his conversation with Becky the second time, I got a little emotional because I felt guilty. And I felt bad for how I felt 30 years ago. Yeah. I think I may have even texted that to you. Like, man, this yeah. is some deep shit. Yeah. It really is. And, um, you know, he's done so much following the reality show. Powell went on to become an author and activist. He has published 14 books, including 2020, the year that changed America released this year is also a democratic uh, candidate for Congress in Brooklyn in 2008 in 2010 he's the perfect voice he is the perfect voice absolutely I, like anytime he speaks it's like poetry like it's he like i feel like i'm listening and and like expanding my mind to like a new philosophies type of thing and i also have to say like how brave of kevin to uh speak his truth like all of those years later when i'm sure the climate was like a lot more ignorant than even it is now oh today. my god it was horrible and i'm, I'm just going to tell you when you do watch the original real world and you hear his poetry it's amazing yeah like he you know he really tells people he's like i'm trying to explain to you i'm a black man in america Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to explain to you where I come from and you telling me that, oh, I'm not racist because I have three black friends is, in fact, a racist statement without you understanding it. You don't understand me. You don't know my life. You've yeah. never been in my shoes. And Becky turns around and says, well, you've never been in my shoes. Oh, my God. He don't want to be in no white bitch's shoes. <laughs> it's like so white people fall into this trap very easily of yes. like they they try so hard allison to like yeah. to say like look i'm oppressed too <laughs> you know what i mean uh, I, and it doesn't work <laughs> because it's just simply not true and not on any type of scale that people of color have to go through um and it's it's so mind-numbing to me to like watch people like becky uh say like listen like i i've been oppressed too like you don't understand like i've had to go yeah. through troubles like it's not like no matter like you could have like the worst like background growing up like if you are white compared to if you are black like it's just going to be a different uh set of rules that like you have to have to um you know deal with um yeah. that society puts on you um and uh, i don't know i just I uh, I would love for like my my family and like other people that like lean more conservatively to like watch that conversation with yeah. with Becky and Kevin. Um, and I also want to say, Allison, like this uh, uh, real world homecoming has done a, a really fucking amazing job at like uh, splicing back to like the conversations they were having thirty years ago, oh, like wait, reflecting wait, wait, wait. like. It, it, like just the like transition from like them talking 30 years ago to like what they're saying now uh it's just like a like a, a a flawless like execution like the production of like intertwining like uh i mean even after becky walks off like they cut to like uh norman saying 30 years ago like becky will never listen to anybody like she's just like set in her ways and and to see that like these people had themselves figured out like 30 years ago about each other and those statements still hold true today it's just like it's amazing that somebody watched that and, and we're like yeah we need to put this moment on real world homecoming uh oh. it's it's just very well done listen to this this is for you this is for you yeah joseph said mtv missed out on having the show on air today it would be something fresher 
uh, fresher than uh, outside of it, you know, ridiculousness. <laughs> yeah, now, exactly. let me tell you not only do we have to deal with that shit, mm -hmm. we now have deliciousness, which is horrible. <laughs> I don't know if anyone is that's ridiculous. Oh, but anyway, don't get, I could go all day. Here's another thing. I realized I would love to meet Kevin because something that hit me really hard while watching his conversation, and it wasn't just the conversation with Becky, it was the aftermath of that conversation. Yeah. I realized, you know, I left my son's father when I was 21. My son was barely two. I had less than $200 in my pocket. I had no car. I had no job. I had nothing. But I still had more opportunity to get help and go far because of the way I looked. Yeah. You know, and I have take I took that for granted as a 21 year old as now I'm like, my God, Alice, I'm going to smack you. You had such opportunity and you didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many women of color out there who have children and are in bad situations and people just won't help them. Yeah. And it makes me sad. And, you know, I just think that's something we need, you know, that needs to be addressed. So. Yeah. Norm. <laughs> I love Norm. Norm was my first gay friend. He was my first gay friend on TV. Oh, like talking. this was like your first like gay character that you saw on television. Yeah, like I went to high school with a guy that yeah. okay, he was gay, but he wasn't out and yeah. he wouldn't admit it. Okay, yeah. but we knew. But this was like norm. And I was like, I loved him. Like yeah. everything about him, being an artist, going from Michigan to New York. I'm gonna tell you a funny story when this is all. <laughs> but I mean, I just love him. Let's see, what does it say about him? One of the first openly gay people to appear on television as himself. Everybody made a big deal when Roseanne Barr kissed Meryl Hemingway on her show yeah, uh -huh. in 1992. Everybody <laughs> made a big deal when Ellen came out as gay mm -hmm. on her show. You know what happened first? Norman Corby. Mm -hmm. And that was Corby. him playing himself. You know he what I mean? Himself. Like I just uh, spoke about like uh, Kevin's bravery, uh, you know, being uh, like saying like, and like speaking his truth uh, all those years ago, like same goes for, for Norman on a, on a different level, but one that I can certainly relate to, like having grown up in like a small town and, and having my own coming out story and everything. Uh, I, I have really enjoyed Norman so far, um, a little bit more than I thought he was going to be like, I feel like I'm conditioned to have like the gay guy on a reality show be like a sassy, like troublemaker kind yeah. of like, uh, can't keep a secret to save their life type of thing. But Norman is just like a really great, uh, breath of fresh air. And I honestly related to how much like COVID like hit him. Uh, yes. this year because like as a wedding photographer like of course like that didn't really happen this past year for me um and i understood like the struggles he was going through and mm -hmm. in, in the decisions he was having to make and stuff and um i just also think that that's so brave to share that story and not like be embarrassed by it um yeah. I, that's brave yeah that is so brave and to share your story and to let other people know you can make it, you know, and the way everyone encouraged him to make them chocolate bunnies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, I want one of them chocolate bunnies, Norm. <laughs> I want one. I want them. Um, so, I want to get under the blanket with him and Heather <laughs> on the couch, okay? Oh, that's everybody? Yeah, that's everybody. Hey, that was everybody, okay. <laughs> um. So... Uh, let's see. So I think we had a question in the chat about like, uh, I don't know, just like, uh, my question to you is like, when did casting kind of like start to change, uh, for the real world in your opinion? Uh, because like, I think they were talking about how like they had like the real world Facebook, uh, in Atlanta, like two years ago or whatever. And it was just like a garbage season that didn't amount to anything where like, <laughs> You can have these same people come back 30 years later and still make like such an amazing show. 
Um, what do you think is like missing that that is so special here that worked so well here? I'm going to tell you what ruined the real world, social media mm. and the internet. And this is why, because if you look back, the original real world, nobody knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. LA real world season two real world original real world was airing when they filmed that so they really didn't have an idea they had a little bit of an idea but not really you get to real world three in san francisco they have an idea mm -hmm. and it was still fine you know we had pedro we had all of that we had puck and it was still to me real people but i think that as we get into the turn here around I want to say around 2000 when the internet, you know, you're really getting into all of this stuff. I think people just want to be famous. They just wanted to be on TV and, and the casting was very similar in the last few years of that of big brother us. I mean, mm -hmm. they just, these influencers, these people that, you know, and people were losing interest. The last season of the real world, aired on fucking Facebook. Mm -hmm. I've watched, I think one episode and that's only because I had diarrhea in the middle of the night and I came across <laughs> it on my news yeah. feed. Okay. Yeah. That's it. And I never watched the next episode. So I think that was the last time. Yeah. Um, actually they did have uh, Caitlin. On first. Real World Brooklyn. Yeah. She, you know, a lot of people give uh, Audrey Middleton credit for being mm -hmm. transgender um, on Big Brother, yes. But Caitlin first, first, first. Yeah. In um, the real world, when mm -hmm. it was still the real world, you know, not taking anything away from It was 2009. Yeah, 2009. That's also when, um, fun fact, they started making the real world an hour because yeah. it used to be only 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, it was an hour. Yeah. You turned it down. Um, but I think Matt brings up a good point. Like it went from social experiment to hopes of instant fame, uh, which is like so. Isn't that true. the case with all of it, though? I mean, let's be honest for a minute, Tyler. Isn't that besides a you and me? Because we're different. We're special. Mm -hmm. We love the game. We love Survivor. We love Big Brother. We love the game, the strategy. We love all of it. But isn't it has burnt? it has spiraled out to the point of people wanting that fame that they're not even trying to get on these shows. Big brother so-and-so are casting from Instagram and from Twitter and from all these other shows. Yeah. Your followers don't matter now instead yeah. of like the words that come out of your mouth and yeah. the, the stories that you, you can share. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it, it breeds a lot of inauthenticity, uh, and it breeds like, you know, like I think about like uh, this big brother all-stars <laughs> that we just had <laughs> and yeah. how like boring and like shallow and hollow, like uh, the, the game, like Cody played a very impressive game, but like the people there were just so, uh, they had no substance to them whatsoever except for Kaser, which is why like you and i like it pulled out our heartstrings to see him uh back in in like on our screen again talking about these issues it, and stuff like i that. freaking i cried when he got yeah the boot because mm -hmm. it brought back you know i have had people say to me in my family in my life friends god why do you watch so much reality is the can you not get a life do you not have anything else better to do um and the answer is yes i do but i choose to engage in some of these shows because had there never been a real world new york in 1992 i don't know where i would be right now yeah. i don't know what my life would be like we definitely wouldn't be you and i definitely would know each other and be sitting here yeah my first because, season of the real world was the real world austin and i feel yeah. like that totally like changed uh how like i consumed reality tv and, and i feel like it, it shaped me as a person um in terms of like learning about like people that have a different uh um, like I remember Nehemiah was like very, very like anti-war, very like, uh, very liberal. And me as somebody who grew up in, I was like in middle school at the time, uh, under like my parents' roof who are like very conservative. Like 
I totally disagreed with everything Nehemiah had to say, but like watching it now, I'm like, man, this, this guy is, is so smart and so like woke for his age. You know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, I would have never, I would have never even like heard him like talk about these things if he wasn't cast on reality television. Uh, and that's what I think is the magic of it is like, uh, exposing people like you and I to, to different backgrounds that we have never seen or would have never seen otherwise. Right. And we all don't have to agree. You know, yeah. you may be Republican and you may be a Democrat and I'm listening to a Republican talk mm -hmm. and it's like, I hear what you're saying and I'm listening to you and where you're coming from and you really believe these things. And that's fine. I'm not going to judge you for it. I'm not going to cancel you for it. Yeah. I want to be educated as to why you support certain things and mm -hmm. why you believe certain things. And I'll be honest with you. Um, when I was younger, Tyler, um, I went through this whole one. I think I went through six months where I tried to be an atheist. But let me tell you something. That shit didn't stick. Yeah. Okay. And it, it just didn't. I was very, 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 very pro life. Okay. I mean, I was one of those people. Now, I never stood on the side of the street with a brochure or a sign. Okay. But when I got older and met someone who went through this experience, it changed my whole outlook and changed my whole perception definitely you know it's just you people can don't have to agree you can follow who you want to vote for you can do that doesn't mean everyone has to cancel everybody okay everyone is allowed be a total, like separate show <laughs> that could be a total you're allowed to have differences of opinion that's the great thing about this country is you can believe what you want Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can choose to listen to somebody or you cannot choose to listen to somebody. I believe there are too many Beckys in this country right now. There, I said it. There are too many Beckys. That's a new word. I said it. All from listening to like and learning, um, which is like, <laughs> it's such a, like a, a, a stop. It's such like a, yeah. a speed bump for any kind of like progress. Um, but uh, I, I know we got to wrap up soon because uh, my, my dinner is on the way, but um, I feel like we're like just starting to like skim the surface of this conversation. I don't know if you've seen the the next episode of Andy Cohen's uh, reality TV documentary, um, but I, I would love to like have a part two uh, about like this whole topic yeah. in like another week or two. So um, you're probably, I'm sure you're down for that as well, but like we have so much that we could get into in terms of like, the evolution of reality TV, like even like they they have even like brushed on like the morals of uh, giving these seven strangers like platforms and then just kind of like dumping them into the real world uh, with that new fame. Like child and, actors. Yeah, and they didn't know what to do with it at the right. time, and still like even now to an extent. But like um, you know, just kind of like not even knowing like the magic that they had <laughs> there at the time. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I, I definitely want to keep talking about this with you. I think what we're going to do, what are there eight episodes? Uh, I don't think we know, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's eight. I would like to, you know, we'll, we'll reconvene here in a couple of weeks. Yeah. When it, I think the four through eight mm -hmm. and, um, you know, touch on some more stuff. And I would yeah. love to do a little bit more of the history, our history of reality. Cause honey, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting right here. I'm oh. your encyclopedia. <laughs> One second, one second. Okay, his fate's here. His fate's here. Let me tell y'all something. I know way too much about reality TV, but let me tell you something. I've said it for years. I am full of useless information, but you know what that has gotten me? I have answered more questions on Jeopardy and solved more puzzles on Will Fortune because I know absolutely everything there is to know about nothing. Trust me. I think I'm going to try out for Wheel of Fortune, to be honest with you. But um, trying to keep up with what everyone is saying. I know he's got to eat. And, um, you know, I just wish that there weren't so many, you know, Beckys in the world that refuse to listen. And I know it's hard when 
you have such a strong belief and it gets to the point where I don't want to understand where this person is coming from. I don't want to hear what they have to say, you know, but why are you afraid you might relate or maybe you might understand why they feel that way? You know, kind of ask yourself that why, you know, don't just cut someone off, kind of give them the chance to speak and really listen and wait your turn. There was a, there is a, I think from the movie Pulp Fiction, when Uma Thurman and um, I think uh, uh, John Travolta are talking and they're like having a conversation. It's like sometimes when you're having a conversation with someone, isn't it more about thinking about what you're going to say next rather than listening? Think about that. That is so true. Do you do that? Do I personally do that? I'm talking to everybody. I was going to say, I feel like I do a pretty good job listening, but yeah. I'm sure some people in my life would disagree with that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's so true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's like you're just waiting for like your your turn to speak. Yeah. Like your your turn for like retaliation, like, ha, I'm going to get them with this rather than like absorbing like what they're saying and trying to understand that. <laughs> because you're listening someone who's talking about something you don't agree with that doesn't mean that you're on their level and you're bad and you agree with them it's just listening and communicating and creating a peaceful dialogue and communication and educating one another you never know what you will learn and what wisdom you can pass on to help someone else so that's all i'm gonna say i'm gonna be a grandma i gotta practice <laughs> <laughs> but I'm you're you're trying and, and that's 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 the key you know that's that's, that's right. all anybody can do about anything um so i so this is part one we will definitely come back to this uh in a few weeks uh to talk about part two and i would just like love to 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 do like a recap of like the andy cohen like documentary about reality tv on e um at some point too because it's just very well done very fascinating um yes. And, and uh, is it wrong of me to throw out that I would love to have a person of color? No, on this show with us. Like, I, I would really love to have like that perspective. I want that perspective on the show because we're two white people. Okay. Right. <laughs> I would love if anyone wants to reach out to us on Twitter or anything, please let's have the dialogue. I want to be edgy. I want to hear it. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. And uh, thank you guys so much. For watching we will be back wednesday god help <laughs> us for the challenge i'm gonna take another valium <laughs> yes uh, just you're taking valium wednesday nights before the show that gets yeah, them easier that way experience um yeah. and then of course we'll be back on thursday to talk about week five of big brother canada season nine uh can't wait to talk about the invisible hoh twist uh which is Ooh. very exciting Ooh, spooky um and uh so yeah so those are our two shows we're we're trying to plan a patron zone show pretty soon as well so if you have any input oh, about you want to hear about that valencia oh. Let's see. We are definitely going to have you on the next time we talk about this. We people are voting for her and uh, they all vote for her. And she said, I don't mind. Girl, come on. I'm going to get in touch with you on Facebook. We're going. Yeah, I want you on. Here. Also, Valencia, we love you so much. Like, thank you for all that you have done over the yes. years. Us. Thank you for uh, just being like such a selfless person as a healthcare professional during yes. like this entire uh, pandemic and everything. Like, God bless you. Like, you are an amazing, amazing soul, and uh, we are lucky to have you in our lives. And we would love to she's, the chance. She's been, to talk to you. she's been with me since the beginning, son. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure that that she knows how much we we love and appreciate her as well. So, uh, and all of right, course, guys. Matt for for modding the chat as always, and. Yes. Uh, all that stuff, Matt, you know, we love you too. Yes. Uh, all right, cool. Well, um, with that being said, everybody have a great rest of your night. My dog is currently licking my foot. Oh, wait, let me show you a uh, little Sora on air. Oh, I thought you were going to show us the turd. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that dog is so freaking cute. I can't stand it. I know. She's such a little potato. Love her so much. I could. I never thought I could be so obsessed with something, but she's my sweet little You've angel. Changed. I have You've changed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, we love you. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.